Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and uh, the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. I mean, try that in the car park after you take somebody's keys and get in the car. They say, Watch out, the Lord has need of this car. I say, yeah, thank you very much. I have it back, please. Verse 4. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So you see, Jesus knows the scripture. And he takes the scripture and deliberately fulfills it. It didn't just happen. It was deliberate. You see, he said, I want a donkey. You'll find it there. We're going to do it. And he was saying, I am Messiah. And this, for everybody who had eyes to see and ears to hear, would say, this is Messiah coming into Jerusalem. And we go on and read the story. Some recognized him. They began to praise him in the words of Psalm 118, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when they came to Jerusalem, all Jerusalem said, who is this? And they said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Pretty good that at least accepted his prophethood, but very few acknowledged that he was Messiah. And uh, not very long afterwards, you read about it in Matthew 23, verse 37. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem and says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. They refused the kingdom. And as a result of that, Jerusalem didn't survive within the next generation. Temple was destroyed. And God was saying, I have removed the kingdom from Israel, giving it to another nation who will bear its fruits. Now that sounds incredibly harsh, but listen to this, verse 38. See your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, shall not see, you shall see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. <laughs> Here's some hope, because God is saying, Israel is not finished. There is a blindness in part that the Gentiles might come in, but the time is coming when the nation of Israel, the Jewish people will say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're going to see him. They're going to receive their own Messiah. Praise God for that. That's happening. And in the mystery of God's kingdom, the kingdom that was offered and then refused by the Jews. Not all of them, of course. All the early disciples were Jews. Of course, not everybody rejected him. But those that did, God says, the day is coming when you're going to see who I am. But now, in the meantime, the kingdom is being offered elsewhere. And, and when the door closed upon the Jewish nation, it opened upon all of the Gentiles. Praise God. And we're not proud or arrogant about that because it means that if we, the wild olive branches, can be grafted into the natural tree, how much more can the natural olive branches be regrafted in again? And today we are seeing more Jewish people come to faith in Yeshua HaMashiach than ever before in history. God is on the move. So here we have the introduction of the kingdom. Okay, so moving on, moving on. The unambiguous assertion of Jesus' messiahship. People who say Jesus never claimed to be Messiah, they don't know Zechariah 9, verse 9. They don't know Matthew 21. They don't know nothing. Jesus clearly claimed to be Messiah. But the Messiahship that he offered was very different from the Messiahship that was expected. One of the great miracles of Jesus' ministry was that he took the false concepts of Messiahship and reshaped them into the biblical understanding, the Old Testament understanding. The king is coming not with high and mighty demonstrations of outward power and military glory, but coming on the back of a donkey, meekness and majesty, as Graham Kendrick wrote in his song, coming together, one glorious king. Now, there was a reason for this. God will not force his kingdom on anybody. 
And when he's rejected, even in his rejection comes the salvation of everybody. So this was all part of the plan, part of the program of God. In Jerusalem, Jesus was rejected and crucified, but he rose again from the dead, having effected for us a spiritual salvation, a spiritual redemption. So now the kingdom of God requires three things. And it just so happens that R.T. Kendall has concluded the last week or so a most beautiful series on faith, hope, and love. And these are the three things required by the kingdom of God. Number one, faith. What is faith? Faith is seeing the invisible. That's what it is. We walk by faith, not by sight. Secondly, hope. Wonderful thing about hope is when we look around today, we say, this is not all that it is. This is not all we're going to have. It's not going to end this way. And thank God for that. Because when we look out into the world today, we see so many evil structures. One thing we're going to tackle is slavery, and we're going to see how that works. That's where this message is heading. Okay? So there are evil structures and stuff that is going on in the world, and we are called to witness to Jesus. Uh, But we know that the day is coming, which is our hope, the blessed, glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. He's going to come back to this earth, and he's going to not ride, as it were, on the back of a donkey. He's going to come on the glory of heaven itself, and he's going to bring heaven to earth, and, and God's dwelling place is going to be with men. There's going to be a renewal of all things, New Testament says it's not that we escape here to get the heaven out of here and let the world rot to death and the Antichrist come and Jesus destroy the world. No, no, no. He's going to recreate it. He's going to remake it. There's going to be the regeneration. That's what the Bible says. There's going to be the restoration of all things. That's what the Bible says. The Bible also says, Peter describes it as the new heavens and the new earth. But in the meantime, how do we live? Love. That is the spirit of the kingdom. Love. God is the great lover. What is love? You can describe it many things. I define it this way. Love is putting you first at whatever cost to myself. Is there ever a clearer picture of love than the Christ who died on the cross saying, I'm putting your needs first Uh, whatever cost to myself, and if it costs me everything, and it will. If I have to give my very life, and I will, I will do it because I love you. Tell you a story. Told you this before. It's one of my illustrations. One day, Granny invites you home to tea. A little bit reluctant. She's a nice old lady, but she does go on a bit. She smells a bit of mothballs, and she lives up that rickety a street up the top of the hill, but she's got this amazing big house. It's a bit dilapidated. The rain falls in, the wallpaper's peeling off. Anyway, she sits you down, makes you a big cup of tea and some Victoria sponge cake, and she says, Now, dear, I brought you here to tell you something. I've got good news for you, dear. When I go, all this will be yours. <laughs> what did you say, Granny? All this will be yours. All this will be mine. Yes, I, I, I'm leaving it all to you. I I put you in my will. You're going to inherit everything. You're going to inherit all of this. You sit back, make yourself a little more comfortable than before in this big granny seat. You look around and say, no, granny, do you think we need to fix the roof? Well, how about the garden? Let's get some friends around and start digging the garden. When you know you're going to inherit it, you look at it differently. So God says, look at the world. This isn't your place from which you escape. This is going to be transformed when Jesus returns and you are going to inherit it. So begin now to influence it. Influence today what you're going to inherit tomorrow. And the truth is, the more you influence it, the more you're going to inherit of it. That's the kingdom of God. Faith, hope, and love. First one is relationship. But if we live in relationship with Jesus Christ... It's not personal and confined behind closed doors in the secrecy of of your own church building or house. No, no, no. That reflects through you. Love is always outward looking. And when we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we cannot help but to begin to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so we are called, number one, for relationship. Number two, for impact. 
That's what the image of God means. He created male and female in the image of God. And then he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it so the whole world may be filled with my glory, people who love me, people who surrender to me. That's why you are on this planet. And as we said last week, where you are called to work your location, your work location is the place where God has called you to minister for him according to your true vocation. And now, moving on from that, we're called to be agents of change. Your impact demonstrates the kingdom, shows that the kingdom is real. It really works. You are change agents, and you are part of God's redemptive plan for the world, for the universe. So how do we change the world? By putting the relational glory of God on display. By the way we relate to other people. What is love? Love is putting other people first at whatever cost to you. That's divine love. And this revolution has already begun. We read about it last week. If we go back to Ephesians chapter 6 momentarily to see where we were, At the end of verse 9, it says, And you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master is also in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Then verse 10 goes on. We'll come back to this at another time and do a series on it. It's talking about how we take our stand in the world against principalities and powers. That's where Paul goes on to. But before we get there, I want to show you that he's already introduced this theme of tackling principalities and powers in his treatment of the institution of slavery. Now, it requires a little bit of reflection to see this, because my first thought when I was expounding slaves and masters and how we should behave under the title of life in the spirit at work, I was stretching a point. Because he's describing slavery and saying, you Christian servants, slaves, this is how you should behave towards your masters. Love them, serve them, obey them as if you were serving Jesus. And masters, you do the same. Now, what we might have expected was that Paul would say, now you masters, you bounders, how dare you possess property, human beings made in the image of God. Let them all free, change everything, bring revolution, and we'll bring an end to slavery within a generation. And that kind of question still remains. We'll see in a moment, of course, that slavery did come to an end, at least in certain seasons, and it was Christians who brought slavery to to an end. William Wilberforce, finally, towards the end of his life, 1833, slavery was finally abolished in the the, uh, British Empire. And at that time when he did that, one in six people in the world were in the British Empire. By the end of the century, one in four people. It was a significant victory. But even back in the early church, teacher after teacher began to speak against slavery. Augustine in the fifth century one of the great fathers of the early Christian church upon which we base so much of our understanding, a great, great theologian. He was the theologian of the image of God and helped explain what it meant to be made in the image of God. He was also the great theologian of human sin, being able to explain how that we have fallen short of the glory of God. And he, Augustine, said, slavery is the fruit of sinful human conduct. It was a big revelation at the time. And great masters and teachers throughout history have proclaimed those things. And coming right up into the 1800s when slavery was abolished as a result of the work of the Quakers, other evangelical believers, and in particular, William Wilberforce. At the age of 28, Wilberforce said, I've got two great purposes that God has for my life. One is the abolition of slavery, and secondly, the reformation of morals. Here were people who were ready to stand up and fight for what they believed, not just to preach the gospel and and rest in peace, but to say, let's see what the gospel has to say. The gospel has implications. And right back in the day, 
when Paul spoke to the slaves and said, obey them, obey your masters, and serve them as if you were serving God. And, and masters, you remember, you've got a master in heaven, and you be kind to your slaves. And then in a story, one of the great stories of the New Testament, the story told in the book of Philemon, when Onesimus, one of the, Onesimus, one of the slaves, who was a runaway slave belonging to Philemon, came to Paul, and Onesimus found Christ. And Paul writes a letter. You read it in the book of Philemon. Paul writes a letter to Philemon. He says, Philemon, you owe me your very life. Now that I'm asking you to do something, I'm not going to command you to do it. I'm asking you to do something. Uh, Onesimus, if he owes you anything, I will pay. And you might think that he would say, now, wake up, wise up, you unspiritual thing, you. This, you should never own a slave. You've got to get rid of this slavery and you should set him free. Paul all but says that, but he refrains from stating that and says something even more devastating. Something that is, is even more destructive of slavery. He says to Philemon, receive him as a brother and be reconciled. You would never speak to a slave owner like that. You would never cause such uh, something so, which is so damaging to slavery unless you were a born-again believer and, and yes, you, were, you, you were understanding exactly what you're doing. Paul is demolishing slavery but through relationship. And that's what happens. And we can demolish every evil thing through relationship. Think for a while today about all of you. The relationships that you have, you can call them connections. Every day you go to places where I will never be able to go. Apart from one thing, I'm one person and you are many. But also, I can't be in your office. And if we were to talk today about just this group of people and others who are in the network, where we are, people working in the royal household, people working in the houses of parliament, people working in the high fashion offices of our generation, people working in big business. And you might have a small job in a big business, but you are a big person in the eyes of God. He's put you there. And how you relate to people, even a servant girl can speak to the king of, of Syria and say, wise up, come on now. You, it doesn't matter who you are. In your relationship, as you love like Jesus loved and develop the kind of relationships that put God on display, you are not just speaking of another world, you are exhibiting another world and you are bringing another world in. There's a whole new modern slavery bill that, was, that came into, into force in 2015 and more and more of its measures are being, are being enacted. And so we need to understand that this issue is a social issue of our day. Now, it might not be slavery for you. It might be abortion. It might be any of the other things that are working in our institutions today where you, where you want to make a difference in people's lives. Whether it might be, it might be some massive thing. You might be a, a Wilberforce saying before, in my generation, this is what God has called me to do, to change the morals of our nation. And to do, you, God may call you to do that, but the fact is he's calling all of us to be change makers right where we are by putting God on display. And so when Paul writes to Philemon, verse 15, he says, for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that's Philemon, the 21 chapter, verse 15. For perhaps he departed Onesimus for a while for this purpose. Departed, he ran away. He departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. Hmm. Forever. I mean, forever. That's what he means. This relationship ain't going to end by death. Because... We have eternal life. Verse 16, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, our beloved brother. Christian brotherhood, Christian love, Christian charity destroys the, 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 the roots of slavery. And it destroys the roots of everything else that is evil. And you mean we think about it. In our society, everything that is evil in institutionally is rooted in human exploitation. 
in greed or in some form of assertion of power of one person over another person. The only place to stand is at the foot of the cross to acknowledge that there and there alone not only is atonement made, but death to the self-centered fleshly way of living. What is it for you? Slavery? Social reform today? What about what's happening in your own home and family right now? The problems that you are facing? What would change if you loved with the love of Jesus? Whatever cost to yourself. We don't want to do that. We want to say, I love you if you love me. I love you if you love me back. Well, I love you if you love me first. We, we, we do others before they, before they do us. Instead of do unto others, but we do them before they do us. I'm going to do you before you do me. <laughs> that's, the, that's the spirit of this age. God says, no, no, no. Hook on this. Value every person as, a, as an image bearer. If there was one revolution I would like to bring in Britain is the restoration of the understanding of the image of God in humanity. You will no longer be a secularist. You will no longer be a humanist. You will no longer be an unbeliever. You will no longer be a religionist. You'd love Jesus because that's the logical conclusion. If you understand the image of God, only Jesus came to redeem us and to make us again into the image of God. And when we understand the image of God, we will value all life. We will value those poor people who are in the thousands fleeing from war in Syria. We won't treat them like cattle and lock them up in a jungle. We'll receive them into our very homes in the love of Jesus, made in the image of God. Amen? Yes? We, we would not treat people as slaves, slave to our needs, slave to our desires, slave to our careers, slave to our satisfaction. Well, no, we'll be there to serve the image of God in others. That whatever I do for you, I want to see more of God in you at the end than at the beginning. That's what Christian fellowship is all about. We live in a world of image bearers. Fallen, broken, yes. Lost, yes. Separated from God, yes. Needing reconciliation, salvation, restoration, yes. But that's why we are here. God grant another evangelical awakening in our own generation that preaches the gospel as the bedrock of society, but goes beyond that also to allow the implications of the gospel to find full expression in every part of society. Amen and amen. amen. I want to finish by telling a story of a man who ministered so powerfully in his generation that when he died, the people who came out to his funeral, by comparison to the population of London, were as many as those who came out, proportionally speaking, to Princess Diana's funeral. Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And in 1883, 50 years after the abolition of slavery, he preached a powerful message in his church pulpit, Metropolitan Tabernacle. And the sermon was entitled... The best war cry. And he used as his text Numbers 23, verse 21, which is a text taken when Balaam and Balak were about the business of trying to curse God's people. And words of blessing poured out of the, out of the mouth of that false prophet, words of truth. And this is what was spoken of the people of God the Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Now one of Spurgeon's points was there comes a time when God's presence in his church becomes the presence as loud and as fierce and as destructive to evil as a lion attacking its prey. And this is what he says, when God is with his people, he will give them a power of a destructive kind 
Do not be frightened. Here is the text for it. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself a young lion that is a lion in the fullness of his vigor. He shall not lie down till he eats of the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. God has put into his church, when he is in it, a most wonderful destructive power against spiritual wickedness. You see, this is where Paul is going in his exposition. He's going to talk about spiritual warfare, you see. We're right on the cusp of this. Then he goes on to say, a healthy church kills error and tears evil to pieces. And he comes to this point, not so very long ago, 50 years before, our nation tolerated slavery in our colonies. Philanthropists endeavored to destroy slavery. But when was it utterly abolished? It was when Wilberforce roused the Church of God and when the Church of God addressed herself to the conflict that she tore the evil thing to pieces. I've been amused with what Wilberforce said the day after they passed the Act of Emancipation. He merrily said to a friend when it was all done, is there not something else we can abolish? That was said playfully, but it shows the spirit of the Church of God. She lives in conflict and victory. Her mission is to destroy everything that is bad in the land. What fighting words they are. And so, we are part of this great revolution, this revolution of love, where we allow the Holy Spirit to take over our lives completely, and we understand that we are in the kingdom of God, and by faith we live it, and by hope we expect it and live for its future manifestation, not this present world. When it comes to this present world, we live in love to bring the kind of changes that will welcome the return of Jesus Christ and will be part of that future kingdom to the glory of God. Give Jesus a big praise in this place.